Welcome to a very special bonus episode of The Spouter In. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And today we are very excited to welcome to the podcast David Hedbonik. David is a poet, a translator, and a medieval scholar. And his Aeneid Books 1 through 6 was published by Shearsman Books in 2015. In 2012, he edited Thomas Meyer's Beowulf, published by Punctum Books. And in 2011, he co-edited selections from Jack Spicer's Beowulf for CUNY's Lost and Found Documents series. He's published academic essays on poetic diction in English poetry from the medieval through the early modern period. And his latest book, Holy Sonnets to Orpheus and Other Poems, was published by Delete Press in 2018. I have worked with David a lot, and I'm very excited to have him on the show. Welcome, David. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Suzanne and Chris, for having me on. Now, we're having you on because you translated, or in fact, you're in the middle of translating the Aeneid. Your first half of the book has been published already, but you're still working on the second half, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we have to start by asking, you know, what drew you? Why? Why? Why are you you translating? There are many (laughs) translations of the Aeneid. Why did you decide to tip your hat into the ring as well? Well, it started as homework. Essentially, I was working with a professor named Don McGuire at the University of Buffalo, and we were just hacking our way through various things. And we worked on some Aeneid, some really gripping passages. Actually, the passage that I know you would all had been talking about and that had come up on your Facebook feed, Chris, uh, the very end of the poem, when Aeneas finally confronts Turnus, um, but also the this, this scene where Venus comes down and visits Aeneas when he first lands uh, in Libya. And in all the different sorts of things that we were working on, something really clicked for me with Virgil. I know, you, Chris, you were talking about how, for you, reading through the Latin uh, was a grind until you got to Ovid. That was kind of a treat. Uh, for me, it was just the opposite. I do really enjoy Ovid, but I found something about translating Virgil to be a little more manageable for me. And so I was inspired by weird projects. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with Sandow Burke's translation of Inferno and actually the whole Divine Comedy. He's also done the American Quran, which I just love. I didn't even know that. That's oh my wonderful. God. I, yeah, and his Dante is amazing. Yeah, so uh, things like that. And of course, Thomas Meyer's Beowulf and Christopher Logue's Iliad. So I just thought, you know, why not? Why not just take on this crazy, impossible task of translating this entire book? And uh, it's been a 10 plus year journey. Wow. Had you, uh, had you read the Aeneid in translation before? Not since I was a kid. You read it when you were a kid. <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) that's really neat, because one of the things we were interested in thinking about was, you know, the extent to which it was a school text. And I know that, you know, late 20th century student experience is obviously really different from that thousand plus years that we might talk about. We're talking about Latin education, but but there is a continuity there, too. Yeah, I read. I mean, I'm sure they were like kids versions of the the Odyssey, the Iliad, Mm -hmm. the Aeneid. And then it came back in a big way during my graduate studies, as it would studying medieval material. Do you remember as a kid what parts you liked? Like what spoke to you in it? I think a lot of the same parts. I mean, people talk about, you know, one of the things I love about your show and the question that Chris asked on his his Facebook yesterday was, do you like this book? Mm. The idea of taking pleasure in something. And I think all the, a lot of the same things that people were mentioning are things that, that I, that I took pleasure in, you know, especially books one through six, all the stuff about the travels and getting lost and, the parts with Dido and all the pathos and the journey into hell and all of that stuff. So what's it like doing the last six books? You know, one of the things we were thinking about together is that, you know, we were all on board for the first six books and like book 12 is kind of exciting, but six through 12 in general is like, how can I put it? It's, it's a lot less variety. So what's that experience like working through them? You're, you're in book eight now, right? And you work on the translation. I'm actually about halfway through book 10. I mean, I've actually, I finished the raw translation. I just need to go back. I say I just need to go back. I need to put it into serviceable poetry. Um, about, about halfway through book 10 now. And it's a grind in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I finally got to see Hamilton a few days ago. I'd been listening to the soundtrack for years and I loved it. 
but I felt a little bit the same way in terms of like the first half was so amazing and there's so many great things happening. And then you get to the second half and it's like, suddenly this is, I'm watching Thomas Jefferson and James Madison rap about the constitution (laughs) and he makes it interesting, but let's be honest, it's not as, there's not as much fireworks as there were in the first half. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's analogous to how the second half of Aeneid works. It's a lot of inside baseball sort of treaties being made and broken and, I know I tweeted this a couple of weeks ago. There's there's just a lot of lists in the second half. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's lists of people getting killed and lists of people that are showing up with Aeneas. And it's it gets to be a bit of a grind in, in spots for sure. Or maybe like you were saying, it's inside baseball. Like it's something that we are not attuned in quite the right way to take in. And you know, maybe other generations as well, like medieval commentators were saying, like they comment up through book six. And then after that, they're like, not so much. Mm -hmm. Now, Suzanne, you were reading David's translation for the first time Mm -hmm. just just recently. And I wonder if you would get across to the listeners who maybe haven't read it yet, what it's like as a translation, because it's not like the translations that we were using when we talked about the Aeneid in our main episode. Well, you got to think about what is a translation for, right? So whether it's meant to give you a path into the uh, the text, the original text, so in this case, the Latin text, right? Or whether it's meant to stand on its own as a kind of parallel or a kind of counterpart to the text, right? And so, David, I was reading an um, interview where you talked about your process, how you make what you call just now the raw translation, and then you make it into poetry, you make it into something else. And that's partly the movement from prose into verse, but it's also something else happening there. And so, as a reader, it's like really, I want to say disorienting, but that often has a negative connotation. I don't, it wasn't negative at all. You don't begin where people might expect you to begin with that very famous beginning uh, of Arms and the Man, right? You you put us in a different opening spot. And I think that's really good because it defamiliarizes the text. And then one of the other things you do that's really very different, but I think effective in a really interesting way, um, you divide the books into sections. And sometimes there's an opening Latin line, and then you get you know, your, your verse translation, your rendition of the text, and it's in parts. And so the Aeneid, Virgil's Aeneid is in parts. It's in these 12 books, and but that's continuous within the books, right? We might have different narrative moves, but each book is like a container. And you've made it instead into many parts. And so I found myself thinking a lot about this part-whole relation and what's at stake when we move from an epic in 12 parts where there's this apparently kind of continuous flow within each book uh, to something where we've got instead many separate parts. It's like a mosaic or something. And the fact that there's these amazing illustrations in it that your collaborator um, had done uh, heightens that mosaic effect because we get image as well as words. And the words are very imagey too, like the way the letters are set or the way you use capitals. It's visual uh, in a way that is very different from the Latin text. Anyway, so that's, sorry, that's a lot, but it's, so it's doing something that's very different from the Latin text, but it's also resonating with it or harmonizing with it. I keep thinking of um, uh, oral metaphors for some reason um, in a way that's really satisfying as a reader. The other thing I think is worth noting is that it also, in a sense, uh, it's maybe the wrong word, but streamlines it. Like you mentioned how the very opening, you know, I sing of arms and the man, the, the sort of call to the muse is gone. And a lot of small details are gone throughout the poem, but Nevertheless, by by doing that, I think a lot of the energy and excitement of the poem comes through. You can see this in the sporting section in book five, which we've talked about endlessly now, I suppose. But like the descriptions of the races and the descriptions of the fighting become so much punchier, so to speak, if you are able to carve away and just find the 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 muscular structure of it. I don't know. I keep wanting to use these like it's very muscly, it's very mm. wiry, it's very taut. Um, I don't know if those are adjectives that you're going for. They seem fraught in a work like the Aeneid to describe it that way, but it also seems appropriate. Yeah, I mean, I well, thank you to both of you for those kind words. I mean, I'm I think my ideal reader would be somebody who maybe knew a little bit about the Aeneid, but was not a an expert per se, and would read this and be encouraged to keep going, first of all. So that is one of my intentions is to sort of make it punchy and episodic. And then hopefully seek out, you know, other translations that give a fuller picture or 
ideally the Latin itself, you know, go back and, and look into it and say, wow, did that really happen? I want to go check that out and see what Virgil says or what this other translator says. And I do feel, and I know I've, I've said this in interviews before, that I'm not, there's no obligation that I have to include all the little details. You know, you can find them anywhere. There's probably been five translations just in the past three, four years that have been published on major presses. So I don't feel compelled to do that. Why don't we ask you to, if you'd be willing to, to read a section of it for us so that, again, listeners who haven't encountered your translation can get a deeper taste of what it's like. Is there a, is there a passage you'd like to read out in particular? Uh, well, you'd asked about the foot race in book five. Why not read that? And, you know, it's interesting to sort of circle around to what ends up happening to a couple of these characters in the second half of Aeneid. So maybe we could check that out as well. Uh, and I really felt that Aeneas, you know, why is this whole book here? I know you'd, you'd spoken about nation building and this project that's going on. And I also think it's a little bit of a recuperative effort for the character of Aeneas. I mean, he's just done this really dickish thing. Mm. And now he gets to be a good guy passing out gold rings and that sort of, you know, good king way. And I sort of think of him as a, almost like a carnival barker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gathering crowds and passing out prizes and directing people's attention to this or that. And it's one of the few times in the poem where he's just sort of himself. He's not being directed to do anything by the gods. So I, I feel like there's a little bit of breath of fresh air feeling about it for his character. So second contest, foot race. The crowd gathers around. Aeneas calls out the prizes. Everybody gets something. No one leaves empty handed. I've got shiny Gnossian spears, a polished sword, a gleaming double axe engraved in gold. A first place gets a noble horse. Second, an Amazonian quiver full of Thracian arrows. Third place will be content with this Greek helmet. He speaks, and soon enough, they're off, bursting forth like startled deer. Nisus tears ahead of the others faster than wind and wings and lightning, followed five heartbeats later by Salius, then Euralis, then Helimus and Diorus, hot on his heels. Soon, those weary runners draw close to the finish. An unlucky Nisus, already so certain of victory, he's raising his arms, slips on some blood left over from bulls slaughtered in sacrifice, sliding through the gore covers himself in entrails and shit. But he doesn't forget his buddy, Euralis. Leaning up, he sends Salius sprawling into the thick sand, and so Euralis flashes home, victorious with everyone roaring applause. Helimus comes in second, Diorus third. But Salius screams at the elders that he's been robbed. Euralis is such a popular kid, so distraught and so good-looking that no one wants to take away his prize. Besides that, Diora starts whining since he'd fall off the podium altogether if Salius were awarded first. Relax, says Aeneas. I'm not taking nothing from nobody, but I can sympathize with someone who lost out through no fault of his own. And he throws in the heavy hide of an African lion studded with golden claws for Salius. What about me, says Nisus? I should have won the whole thing. And he lifts up his face and his arms covered in gory filth. Aeneas laughs at him. He holds up a shield made by Dedamoon, which the Greeks once snatched from a column sacred to Neptune. Take this, he says. Now who's ready to box? <laughs> Such a different flavor. I love I actually I was reading that passage this morning and I love I love that spontaneity like um I'm not taking nothing from no one or <laughs> or uh Eurelis not forgetting his buddy, you know. I mean in some ways obviously it's incredibly anachronistic language, but it rings very true like that's the language of that moment. Um and so those struck me on the page as well as when you're reading them just now. I mean, I do love it when somebody says it's very anachronistic language, because at the same time, English is an anachronistic language, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm not accusing you of anything, but it's always this weird thing to catch somebody saying. Like, Well, it's uh, not the, trying to be the Latin. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's, not, it's not trying to be Latinate. It's not trying to feel old. It's not, it's not classicized in that sense. The other thing I really enjoyed about that bit was that it drew out something which I was, you know, saying uh, in the episode about how Aeneas can sympathize with someone who lost out through no fault of his own. And I don't, like, I'm not going to pick 
apart. <laughs> your, your translations, I don't have the Latin in front of me. I have this other translation that I was using. Uh, and it doesn't, it, he doesn't seem to explicitly say that there, but it's totally behind what he's saying. And so it feels like, I don't know if you were, I don't know if you, you were thinking in terms of adding interpretive elements like that into it. I mean, obviously, all translations do that, but, mm -hmm. but I, I, I like, I mean, I'm very much in favor of this. I'm very much approve of making that more explicit of saying, yeah, this is, this is how I'm reading it. Therefore, I feel like I can get away with saying this here. Get away with that's a terrible way of putting it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, I, geez, it's been so long since I did that particular passage, but yeah, throughout, I was very much trying to translate Aeneas's character as much as I was the words that they were actually saying or or being said about them. Uh, one of the things that, that you said, you talking a lot about agency with Aeneas and how, and I do think, I totally agree with what you said, um, he lacks agency throughout the whole poem. He's really being blown around by whatever God happens to get a hold of him at a particular moment and pushes him in a certain direction. You know, I feel heartbroken about that in a lot of ways, you know? Mm. So you're just constantly trying to figure out who this guy is. I think he doesn't even know who he is or what he's supposed to be doing one moment to the next. It's so interesting that it's in the environment of the games that he, he has agency or he has that kind of control because late in book five, you know, once the whole business with the ships is happening and so on, then you have people giving him advice. His father appears to him briefly as an apparition. He um, asks Jupiter to like send the storm to put out the fire in the boats. Like we're back in that usual world of limited agency for Aeneas, but in the games, in the world of the games, that's where he has, that's where he's father Aeneas, right? That's where he's able to control things. That's so interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way before. Yeah, no, that's that's a really interesting point. You brought up the idea that it would be worth tracking some of these characters, tracking, haha, that would be worth tracking some of these characters down for what happens to them in the second half of the book. And I was really interested in some of the ways that these sporting events presage the fighting that they're going to be doing in the second half of, of the Aeneid. So as you're working on that, as you're thinking with those characters now, what is striking you about how these characters, about how book five parallels later events or, or doesn't or... or or what? Well, certainly the friendship between Nisus and Uralis is going to loom large for what happens to them in the second half. And I think, I mean, the problem that Virgil has uh, narratively is that he needs to, you know, Dido has cursed him and said, let them reach Italy, but take away Ascanius, take away his son. Well, that's not going to happen. That can't happen in order for Rome to be founded. So Virgil needs to gin up uh, other losses that he'll have to endure. And the big one, of course, is Pallas. And boy, does he have a lot of work to do to, to make that meaningful. But another one is going to be these guys. Mm -hmm. And to sort of throw something more on the fire, you know, Uralis' mother is, for some reason, along with them at camp. And so it's not just going to be a loss of these two great friends. It's going to be a loss of a son. And boy, does that hit me hard as as a new father, you know, feeling like this book just more and more is about taking away sons from fathers <laughs> and and mothers. And um, but, it, uh, you know, again, it can't be Ascanius. He's literally sort of sealed off in bubble wrap for the war itself. And so, yeah, we get these guys hatching this plan. I mean, to the extent that there's a preview of their characters, I think it's really just the friendship. You get the sense that these guys will do anything for each other. They love each other. There's a bit of a, you know, perhaps a, a homoerotic element to that that emerges in book nine. I've got a few lines of it. Should I read a few lines of it? This sure. is from Mandelbaum. Mm, Nisus was guardian of a gate. Near him stood Euralis, his comrade, and no one who served Aeneas or carried Trojan weapons was more handsome, a boy whose face unshaven showed the first down of his youth. Their minds and hearts were one. In war they charged together, and now, too, they shared a sentry station at one gate. It's just interesting language in the sense that, I mean, there's there's the homoerotic aspect, there's the intimate friendship, there's the companion, you know, comrades-in-arms aspect of it, but they're at one gate their minds and hearts are one. Like this whole idea of two and one, it seems really interesting here. I, I'd mm -hmm. love to see how you translated that. Uh, let's see. I got it right here. 
All along the walls, the whole army camps out, watching, taking shifts, each to his given task. Nisus, their toughest SOB, holds the mm-hmm. gate. He's a good man with a spear and light arrows. With him, Uralis, best looking among the Aniades, who fills out his uniform like nobody's business. <laughs> a fresh faced lad whose cheeks preserve the flower of youth. One love burns between them. In battle, always one right beside the other. And now they man the gates together as sentries. That's good. I like that. What has been some of the more challenging parts to translate, to decide upon, to settle on, to wrestle with? Uh, Book six presented a lot of challenges for me because unlike the sports where I had a pretty firm grounding and footing to sort of get into it and adapt the language of it, book six was especially the part where Anchises is talking to Aeneas about what happens to souls. Mm. And it gets very philosophical and you could almost feel Dante, you know, <laughs> champing at the bit. <laughs> yeah. But I really struggle with that part. And, uh, I had to wrestle with it a lot and I ended up feeling okay with it. I mean, I, again, when he sorts of, when he sort of thumps back to like, you know, this is what Rome is going to be good at. This is what other nations are good at. We're going to be all about empire. Um, then I saw that I was like, yeah, okay, I can, <laughs> I, can, I can handle this part. And then in, in the second half, all the lists, you know, you just end up with these lists of people that other people killed. And one of the ways I, I dealt with that was just to literally write the kill list, colon, and then put a bunch of names. And, uh, you know, it's never just a list. Sometimes you just get the name. Sometimes you get this attribute about them that was very important. Sometimes you get something about their lineage. And there's a big part of me that's just thinking, like, why is this interesting? You know, it's it's certainly interesting if you're thinking about, again, you know, well, this is somebody's ancestor that they're going to see and recognize and be thrilled about. Mm-hmm. So in some cases, yeah, I, there was one section where I put a little asterisk by somebody's name and had kind of a little footnote like, oh, this is something important that Virgil wanted you to know. Hmm. And in some cases, I just cut them out completely. I'm like, I don't care about this part. <laughs> That's neat when you describe that, like the function of the list to provide that little teeny tiny moment of recognition where you have this point of entry, whether it's an ancestor or, or something, because it resonates so beautifully with that moment in book one when Aeneas is looking at the wall paintings, the images in the temple in book one, and he sees Priam and he sees Hector and he sees all these different people and he's like, oh, wow, I know this. And then he sees himself and it's this weird out of your body kind of moment for him. And so it never occurred to me before that that's one of the things that maybe the lists can do too. Yeah. And there's another moment like that when he gets the weapons from his mom. Mm. And I think that's the end of book eight and he's looking at the history of Rome Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's a battle of Actium Mm -hmm. (laughs) depicted on there. (laughs) And it even says like he, he's ignorant of these events, but he's psyched about it anyway. Uh-huh. And it's like, yeah, okay. I'm also thinking about other forms of listing names, you know, that striking New York Times cover uh, that listed all the people, well, not all the people, a, 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 a sliver of the people who had died in the U.S. of COVID or something like the AIDS quilt or the, or the Vietnam War Memorial or something, just ways of just the, the, uh, the amassment of names, the sort mm. of instantiation of them on the page or the quilt or the wall uh, and what that is like like how does that function even if we don't read it even if we find it a boring list to read through perhaps mm. there's something about that that massive ink on the page or the size of the quilt that you can't display in one place at any one time that uh that that is striking i wonder if that's the sort of thing you could use to to pull out some of the emotional weight of a tedious list yeah, sometimes I'm looking at it now, I, I'll use all caps to just, oh, here's a bunch of guys turn is killed, and say a little bit about one of them or two of them and how they how he did it. I do think, I mean, I get the sense that in a similar way to Chaucer, you know, I, I don't feel like Virgil's heart is in the sort of 
depiction of battle scenes nearly as much as it was some of the events in books one through six, which is not to say he he can't do it. I mean, he's great at setting a guy up and then saying, oh, yeah, and then somebody's spear came along and cut him down in mid-sentence and describing how he fell on the ground and gore splattered everywhere. And it becomes a little bit like a Sam Peckinpah sort of butcher shop at certain points, but you don't get the sense that he's really relishing this like he was some of the other stuff. Well, most of the other works that he's known for, I mean, he's known for the Georgics and the Eklogs. They're both sort of long bucolic nature poems, right? Right. I don't, I haven't read them, I'll admit, but I don't think there's any major battle scenes in them. (laughs) This seems like a, this seems like a weird turn in his output. Yeah, which is where I think some of that, that sense that I think you have that this could also be read as a critique, even a satire in spots of the bloodlust of the Roman Empire, you know, I think could you could read that in certain points for sure. Like, do we really need to go into this much of a frenzy, killing this many people? You were talking a little bit earlier about some of the challenges in translating book six. And one of my very favorite things in, in your translation is what you do with that really spectacular moment when the Sybil is speaking. Um, because it's it's striking both in terms of like the way it sounds, like the translation, like just the words, but also it's one of those places where you've used the typesetting to have a certain kind of effect. Mm-hmm. Can I read a little bit of it? Yeah. The truth seekers come to the doorway and she says, it's time to seek the oracles. God, behold God. And she freaks out. Face explodes. Hair wild. Breast heaves. Rage. Soul. Giant. Inhuman. Woman. Swelled by God breath. She roars, what are you waiting for, Aeneas? Do you need a fucking invitation to fall on your knees in prayer? Well, these doors won't open themselves. (laughs) I was like, whoa! (laughs) I mean, it's great. It's totally different from these more literal translations that we're accustomed to. But it does the job. It does the job so interestingly. I mean, in some ways, a little bit like what you do with Aeneas' speech in book five. You know, it's it's not what you're going to find in a conventional literal translation, but it gives you the feeling it rings true in a certain kind of way. It feels the same in the sense that it produces the same emotion in you, um, but it does it in a very different kind of way. I don't know. I loved it. I thought it was very cool. And like visually what it's doing on the page was also very cool. Yeah, I think this is one of the moments where I'm definitely inspired a lot by Thomas Meyer and his use of negative space on a page. He's got the famous scene in Beowulf towards the end when... There's a lone woman keening for keening. That's what Seamus Haney translates it as for Beowulf has just died. And Thomas Meyer, I think he has like two words on one page. She cries or something and then colon and then you have to skip to the next page. And so, I mean, things like that where you're sort of like, this needs some space. This needs a little bit of, you know, whatever's happening here is too intense to just be run together in lines, you know, so... And I do, I, I feel like in hell, things that are scary should happen. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, again, reading Aeneas's character, you know, he's, he's frightened. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, uh, there are moments here where his a chill runs down his spine. And again, you see Dante sort of chomping at the bit to, to put some really grotesque things in, in the Inferno. And I mean, that's, that seems to be what, the moment calls for, you know? And so the language that the priestess uses is also pretty, she swears a lot. She, (laughs) she yells at him sometimes. And I also like the moment when he runs into one of his old friends and they're sort of talking and the, the priestess is like, you know, let's hurry along. And he says to her, you know, don't snap at me. (laughs) (laughs) And so there's this sort of bitchiness in hell that I think it was definitely fun, you know, to work on those parts. Yeah, the scariness comes partly just from, like, the scariness of what she's saying, what's happening, that feeling that's producing those spaced out words on the page. But also it comes from the fact that she looks pretty normal up till then. Like, she's just the priestess. She's like, you know, the lady in charge of the cave, right? And then all of a sudden, she's not that. She's this other thing. I, I, I love that moment. Yeah, and also, I mean, it seems like the 
a metatextual moment too, in the sense that this is sort of what happens when you're possessed by a god and you start spouting poetry and Virgil is asking for that to happen to himself at various points as well. So what are your favorite parts of the poem now? Like you talked earlier about kind of falling in love or at least being captivated by certain parts of the poem by um, the Battle with Turnus in Book 12 or by uh, Aeneas's encounter with his mom with Venus in Book 1 as, as part of your early experience of the poem. Are, have your favorite parts changed or the parts that still speak to you or still have a lot of juice in them? Are they different now or are they the same ones? I think it changes depending on my mood and also my circumstances. Um, so when I was translating, you know, this Books one through six came out in 2015. I literally got the box from my publisher like a week before I moved to Kuwait. And I was not only living in a different country, but also starting a full-time job. So I didn't have as much time to work on the book, which is why it's five years later and I'm still not finished. Uh, but one part I really enjoyed that sort of carried me through is oddly enough, so when Aeneas gets to... Italy, you know, at first everything's fine. And he meets King Latinus and he welcomes him and says, oh, you're the guy that I've been told about. Here's my daughter. And if everything had just ended there, that could have been the end, you know, but Juno wasn't, wasn't about to have that. So he has to go off searching for allies and he finds King Evander. And I at once felt that it was an incredibly boring because Evander is like this blowhard who just, he's, every time they go somewhere, he's like, let me tell you about this. <laughs> Here's a neat story about Hercules. And I just found it really funny after a while. It was a little bit like that scene in Airplane where Ted Stryker is telling everyone this story about oh. how his drinking problem started and people are like committing suicide because it's going on so long. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Like at one point I have Aeneas fall asleep because Evander is just talking and he just won't shut up. So stuff like that I found really just oddly sustaining, you know, to, to keep working on. And then what happens to Nisus and Euralius, actually the part that we've already sort of hinted at, you know, they we revisit them in book nine, they're buddies. And Nisus comes up with this plan and uh, it works, but as often happens, you know, they go too far and they're caught and they're both killed. And it just, the pathos of that is enormous when you, when news gets back to Euralis's mother and it just becomes this sort of miniature tragedy in the midst of this, this book. Yeah. We don't lose sight of the individual people in spite of the big flowing currents of time that are washing over top of them. Right. Yeah, and it's the same with Pallas, because even though you get the sense that, oh man, Aeneas and Pallas must have been super relieved to finally get away from this guy and just get back to the war. Um, but he gives a speech where he says, you know, please bring my son back. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm trusting him with you and uh, teach him all the stuff you know about being a prince and being a leader. I'd go myself if I could, and then he gets going on another long-winded story about the glory days. Um, but you just you feel that being set up as well for man. This just isn't going to end well. Whatever happens here. Yeah, I'm struck by like the ways in which a number of times in in the ways you've described your work with the poem, like the relationship of fathers and sons comes up. I mean, parents and sons more generally, but especially fathers and sons, and that. I mean, that's very overdetermined at certain moments in the text, like in, in the funeral games when um, Aeneas is commemorating the death of his father and in the encounter with his father in the underworld in book six and stuff. But there's also these really subtle ways in which that comes out in your translation. And I was thinking about this one moment at the end of book five, where it's um, the death of Palinurus. Um, mm. So he's the pilot of the ship and he falls, um, he falls asleep and he falls into the water to his death. And, and you say this, O oh, Palinurus, you trusted too much the calm sea and sky. Now full fathom five you lie under ocean naked and unknown until you wash up on some stranger's shore. And it's really lovely. And, but one of the things that's happening, there a bunch of things happening there, but one of the things that's happening there is that evocation of the song in The Tempest. Mm -hmm. Right? And 
Also, I'm trying to remember if this is true or not. And I don't know if this is something that would have been in your mind as well. You know, that chapter, The Masthead in Moby Dick, when there's this risk that, you know, you could fall out into the sea. I think there's an, I think there's an allusion to that same passions in Shakespeare in that passage in Melville. Anyway, so it was one of these moments where it was being very intertextual. And here, with regard to fathers, right? Full fathom five, thy father lies, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I was, I, I, my one question, I have two questions, I guess. One is thinking about this relationship of fathers and sons and how that informs your way of engaging with the text, but also the intertextuality, which is sometimes also almost the kind of relationship of fathers and sons. In that one interview um, that you did, and I was reading, um, you talk about a, a, a sp- almost sports-like relation between these different writers, right? And here you're talking about um, Spicer's attitude toward this. You know, you're, you're all playing on the same field, which is poetry. You grab the ball and toss it to Keats, the shortstop. He relays it to Spencer at second base, then over to Milton at first, though Milton would make a terrible first baseman. Right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's, it, it, and like you're sort of playful with it. But, 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 but there's a fathers and sons thing that's happening in the intertextuality too, and anyway, so I was just really, I think, I think it's incredibly interesting. And I wondered if you've been thinking about that consciously in your engagement with the text. Wow. Well, the Moby Dick, uh, definitely not. It's just been way too long since I read that. But for sure, you know, and again, he's going to run into Palinurus. It's also, it's a little funny because you really don't want to be a pilot for Aeneas. <laughs> There's a pilot who dies in book one. Now Palinurus is gone. It's a little bit like being the drummer and the spinal tap, you know. Defense against the dark arts. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's going to run into him very soon in book six, where he tells him what happened. And it's even worse. It's like, I didn't immediately drown. I floated around. I actually made it to land. I made it to Italy. And then I got stabbed to death. <laughs> I think the emotion is really is part of what sustains me and keeps me going. It's like wanting to find out what happens to people and Virgil's way of, you know, even though you know what's going to happen, there's this great trick that he's able to do over and over again of building in suspense and, you know, piquing your interest and getting you emotionally involved in the characters. And so you're rooting for them, even as you, you sort of know how it's all going to turn out. And as far as the, the illusions goes, I mean, that's just sort of my poetic vocabulary. I'll, I'll just be looking at the raw translation in the Latin and I'll just start to think about how to put it together. And I'm thinking about bits of popular songs, poems I know, books I've read, sometimes newspaper headlines, sometimes something I read in a sports story. And I just sort of throw it in there and see if it fits, see if it works. Well, That might be a good way to segue to what I think is going to have to be our final question, which is that we're doing this as part of a sports cluster. You're a fan of sports. You're a fan of writing. Is there any particular piece of sports writing, sports literature, other than the Aeneid, that has meant a lot to you that you'd like to shout out or or draw people's attention to? Yeah, I think uh, there's a poet, a contemporary poet named Kevin Verone, who's got a really good book called Box Score that's all about baseball. And I think particularly for book six, um, I was really riffing off of some of his moves, especially how he was arranging things visually. He was using a box of text at times and just doing this sort of free association based on various moments in baseball that he loved. And I just thought that was sort of fitting in with with some of the, especially things that were happening with the priestess in book six. Um, So I sort of stole that technique from him. So yeah, (laughs) I'd like to give a shout out to Kevin. It's a great book. (laughs) Good, good, good. Yeah, I've been, I've been meaning to look into his work a bit more. Well, I think that's about all the time we have for today. But once again, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us and and talking to us about your your terrific project. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Uh, I look forward to hearing it and hearing all your other episodes. If you'd like to get in touch with us, listener, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. 
Show notes with links for things that we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 32B. And the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at the Spouter Inn. Thank you.